Hi everyone, welcome to the Claremont County Public Library's Book Lovers Podcast. I'm Shana, and today I am with Jordan and Laura. During this episode, we are going to talk about some spooky, supernatural books. Don't forget to visit our website, claremontlibrary.org, for show notes with links to all of the books that we are talking about today. All right, so Laura, do you want to get us started? Absolutely. So my first choice is A Deadly Education by Naomi Novik, which kicks off a new fantasy series for her. She also wrote Uprooted, which is a great fairy tale retelling, and the Dragons of Tremere series. So this takes the fantasy trope of a magical school and combines it with survival of the fittest with a main character who has the ability to destroy the planet. So Elle, short for Galadriel, grew up in a commune you wouldn't guess that from her name, with her hippie healer mom. <laughs> Unfortunately, Elle's magical affinity is for the dark side. She's a snarky, prickly hedgehog of a human, and it's been prophesized that she's going to destroy the world, which means that she doesn't have many friends or close confidants. She's a student at the Scholomance, a magical school existing in a void cut off from the regular world. Once you've been accepted into the school, you can't leave until you graduate, if you make it that far. The school is full of magical creatures constantly trying to kill the students. It's not even safe to brush your teeth alone, and no one leaves their rooms after lights out. Unsurprisingly, students band together for protection, but Elle's natural reserve plus students' suspicions about her dark magic make alliances hard and friendships even harder until her junior year when she attracts the friendship of the most talented and popular student, Orion. He's all of the things she isn't white, privileged, well-connected, and wealthy. Once Orion starts sitting with her at lunch and hanging out with her in the library, other students start to accept her, which is what she's always wanted, right? Except maybe it's not. So anyway, Mm. good book. She's one of my favorite authors. Really good stuff. I was going to say this one's on my reading list, so I'm excited for this one. Good, yes. Yeah, I really like Naomi Novik. Um, I got introduced to her because a patron had returned this cute little red paperback book with this black dragon on it. And I was like, oh, this looks so cool. And it's the Temeraire series and Temeraire is the dragon and highly recommend. I think there's like nine books. Um, So that really hooked me onto Naomi Novik. So this is definitely on my list. Yes, I was super excited about it. I am sure that I have gone on and on about Lee Bardugo and Ninth House in other episodes, but I'm going to do it again because I can't help myself. (laughs) This one is about Galaxy Call Her Alex Stern. She's the most unlikely member of Yale's freshman class. Raised in LA by a hippie mom, Alex dropped out of school early and fell into a world of shady drug dealer boyfriends, dead-end jobs, and worse. At age 20, she's the sole survivor of a horrific unsolved multiple homicide, but then she's offered a second chance, attend Yale on a full ride. The catch is that she's tasked with monitoring the activities of Yale's secret societies. They tamper with forbidden magic, they raise the dead, and sometimes they prey on the living. I read that last year, about a year ago, and it is awesome. And I think so far the only adult fiction that Lee Bardugo has. Yes, everything Um, else is young adult. mm -hmm. Yeah, I I love her. She's awesome. (laughs) All right, let's go on to the next one. That one's mine. Yeah. Ooh, The Shining. (laughs) Jordan, talking about Stephen King? I know. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Before I get into that, I just have to show I have my my vampire fang necklace oh, sweet. <laughs> for the oh, occasion. I just like had, it. Yeah, I just had to share that. Spooky. All right. So um, I've been reading Stephen King since I was 14. Um, and The Shining, I think, was the seventh book I ever read by Stephen King. And I've read about 40 or 50 others by him in addition to all the other horror I read. And this one is still the scariest book I think I've ever read. Really? So, yeah, it's it's just oh. the way he writes it. It's terrifying. Like, I'm sure a lot of people have seen the, the movie by Stanley Kubrick, which 
you know, does a good job adapting the book, but the book is like 10 times more terrifying than the movie is just the way that it's written. Um, so The Shining by Stephen King. Jack Torrance's new job at the Overlook Hotel is the perfect chance for a fresh start. As the off-season caretaker at the atmospheric old hotel, he'll have plenty of time to spend reconnecting with his family and working on his writing. But as the harsh winter weather sets in, the idyllic location feels ever more remote and more sinister. And the only one to notice the strange and terrible forces gathering around the Overlook is Danny Torrance, a uniquely gifted five-year-old. I've read this twice now, and I'm hoping to listen to the audiobook eventually just to get that experience reading it. Um, I read it while we were in quarantine, <laughs> which I told myself not to do because it's a book about their trap there. And <laughs> that's part of what's so scary about it is the isolation. So I told myself, I was like, do not read this while we're at home for a few weeks. And I, I did it anyway. And you um, did it. You know, I think it's funny about the quarantine period of 2020, because I feel like a lot of people who work at the library, I feel like a lot of us read like the end of the world type of books or like, yeah. you know, and then after it's like, what am I doing? I just read an article and it said that people seem to go one of two ways you're either reading dystopian, bleak, terrible things, or you're reading super fun, fluffy, romance-type novels. Yeah, that's, that's the, the two of us. Yeah, um, that, Shane yeah. and I were just talking about this yeah. this morning. Like, she's been reading, like, the um, fun romance stuff, and then I've mm -hmm. been reading okay. this. <laughs> this yeah. <stuff. laughs> yeah, I've been reading, like, and some of them are super corny, but I'm like, eh, I read it. And, you know, it's just like, it's like a fluffy read to just like, okay, some happiness in 20. Well, I think that's what's reassuring, right? If it's a romance, you're pretty much guaranteed a happily ever after. And exactly. I'm like, okay, all these terrible things can happen to the characters, but I know there's a light at the end of the tunnel. I guess the reason why I leaned that direction is like, oh, it could be worse. You could be in this book. Oh my gosh. That yeah. was, I would not want to be in a Stephen King book. Like, I don't care if it's a happy Stephen King book. I don't, I don't think I'd want to be in that world. Yeah. In no, his mind. Oh. Okay. What is your read alike for this one? It looks kind of creepy, the cover. This is actually the cover um, from the movie adaptation. So this is actually a Swedish book that was translated. Um, it's translated to the title, Let the Right One In. And I'm not going to embarrass myself or the author by trying to pronounce the name. Um, so the author's name is right there. I read this one last year as well. There's just something about Swedish horror. It's just very appealing to me. This is kind of a newer vampire novel. It's set in a Swedish suburb in autumn 1981. So you've got some 80s elements in there, which I love in horror. I'll watch any read, watch listen to anything that's <laughs> horror in the 80s. It just works for some reason. So this book, Let the Right One In, is about a boy named Oscar. He's 10 or 11 years old and he's bullied at school and as a result of that fixated on getting revenge on these kids who bully him. And then he meets Ellie who is a girl about his age and she moves in next door with her father and she only comes out at night. And there are some other occurrences going on as well in the town that only started after they moved in. So it's one of those, like if you like small town stuff, like um, Salem's Lot was another one that I would equate with this one. And I picked this one as a read alike to The Shining because they both have that wintry kind of atmosphere. I think winter is way scarier than fall even though our, your spooky season is fall, winter is way scarier. And I think it's because of stuff like this, like with the extra darkness and the hazardous environments and stuff like that. It makes things so very, very quiet. And even if you live yeah. in the suburbs, it just feels isolated. It's got that muffling effect and mm -hmm. everything's kind of covered up and you don't know what's underneath. Winter is definitely creepy. Yeah, it is. And there's something about like, when it's winter, if it's dark, and if it's cold out, I'm probably in my house, like I'm not going to be out doing strange things. But like, there's something about like, 
like the murderer or like the bad guy in a novel that's set in winter and it's like gosh like you're crazy <laughs> like what are you yeah. doing out <laughs> so yeah it's creepy all right laura so i guess you are next looks like you've got two because i'm the one that made the powerpoint i cheated you cheated <laughs> so i did two books instead of one um, Harrow the Ninth is a new book, but you really have to read Gideon the Ninth, which is the first book. It's the two books of a trilogy. I think the third book is due out next year. It better come out next year. I'll go insane. <laughs> so anyway, Gideon the Ninth and Harrow the Ninth are by Tamsin Muir. And these books are set in a vast space empire ruled over by an undying necro overlord who's served by nine aristocratic houses of necromancers. So these books are hardcore space goth, lots of bones, blackness, and tombs with seriously complex world building. So all of the creepy dead things that you could ever, ever want in your science fiction. In the first book, Gideon the Ninth, the necro overlord has issued a summons for each house to send its best necromancer and cavalier, which is like a bodyguard for the necromancer to compete to be his new lictor. His lictors help him fight off the space beasts that consume and kill entire worlds. So it's a pretty prestigious, dangerous, and important role that can only be entrusted to the best of the best. So um, in Gideon, uh, she's the cavalier for Harrowhark, the reverend daughter and heir of the ninth house of the unlocked tomb. And Gideon is a very sarcastic, unwilling cavalier who just wants to be left alone to read her dirty magazines. But Harrow Hark needs Gideon if she's to ascend to Lichterhood. So off they go to a creepy space palace full of locked rooms and laboratories because only the British pronunciation will do in this case. <laughs> Where they and the other contestants battle it out. Winning is everything and losing means you've died in some painful, awful, probably explosive situation. So in the second book, Harrow the Ninth, it takes up shortly after Gideon ends. And while Gideon the Ninth is pretty much a straightforward story, Harrow the Ninth is absolutely bonkers. It's written in second person point of view, which is tough to pull off. And Harrow oh, is an unreliable <laughs> narrator who possibly is going crazy while she's relating all of these things. Um, and she really needs to pull it together for the looming battle with the Space Beast before they destroy the entire empire. These are super good. The writing is just absolutely amazing and highly recommend them both. And my read-alike is called The Unspoken Name by A.K. Larkwood. Um, this is also the first book in a series. Sorway is the chosen bride of the unspoken, which means she's actually a sacrifice. She's accepting of her fate until a sorcerer appears and offers her a choice, something she's never had before. She can leave with him and live or stay and die. So she forsakes her god and leaves to become the sorcerer's bodyguard thief and sometimes assassin for him. The gods don't like to be forsaken, so there's a reckoning coming. So Ooh. that was very exciting, and I cannot wait for the next installment. Nice. So the unspoken name, that's the first in a series? It is. Ooh. And I, I love that cover. Like, Isn't yeah. that gorgeous? I want to know, yeah, I want to know, like, <laughs> what is going on? Like, what's happening? Because I read an arc of it, and it had sort of the artwork, but it was covered up by a lot of blurbs, right, about, a, mm. you know, that the publisher had. Yeah. Yeah. So when I actually got to see the hardcover, I was like, oh, this is super impactful and very, very attractive. Yeah, and even the other two you mentioned, like, those just look like war, but like a war, like not a normal war, like there's skeletons in the background like that. Mm. And those covers are just like, they catch your attention. The there's, first book is on my reading list as well. There's so much talk. I actually learned a little bit of anatomy because there is so much talk about bones. Yes, they take their necromancy very seriously. Oh my gosh. <laughs> cool. Educational. It was. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. We'll just move right along to the next one. Love this book. I think this was the first book I read by Gillian Flynn. So... I am recommending Sharp Objects by Gillian Flynn um, because it's not really like set around spooky season or anything like that. It's just the way that it's written 
and it's just very atmospheric and you just you want to know what's going on and it's not a very long book you just feel compelled just to read it all in one sitting because you just have to know what's going on and the payoff is definitely worth it returning to her hometown after a long absence to investigate the murders of two girls Reporter Camille Preaker is reunited with her neurotic mother and enigmatic half-sister as she works to uncover the truth about the killings. So she intentionally moved away from her hometown because she just didn't want to be around her family anymore. But she's a reporter now and everyone in her office knows that she's from there. So they're like, hey, did you hear about this? You should go investigate it because you're from there. And she doesn't want to, but she does anyway. And it becomes more personal than she expected. I'll just leave it at that. So a few other notes. This is the same author who wrote Gone Girl, which I absolutely loved. Um, so it has kind of those same elements that anyone who enjoyed Gone Girl, I think he would also enjoy in this book. But it's definitely more on the horror side of stuff you definitely wouldn't want to happen in, in your life. Um, just as a warning to potential readers, there are some themes of self-harm and stuff like that that might be a pretty sensitive topic for people. Be aware of that before you go into it, uh, if that's something you're not comfortable with. Um, so the thing that I've noticed about Gillian Flynn is she will lead you one way and you think you have it figured out and then she'll throw something in. You're like, oh no, then she'll lead you a different way. But what's actually going on is there the whole time. You just didn't really pay attention to it until you know how it ends and then you can pay attention to it the second time around. Um, so I had, I thought I had the ending figured out to this and then what I thought did happen. And I was like, I'm so good. I knew that was going to happen. I got it all figured out. But then what was actually happening, <laughs> what I, which is literally in like the last two chapters and it's within the span of like a paragraph or two, what's actually going on. And I was so freaked out. I was finishing it at like one o'clock in the morning one night because I just had to get it done. I had to know what was going on. And I live on the third floor of my apartment building. And so I can leave my blinds open. And I had my, my lamp on behind me and it was dark outside. So I could see myself in my, in my patio doors. And I just remember like when I read that part, I looked up, made eye contact with my reflection and just started yelling. Like, I can't believe I just read that. <laughs> So it, I had a very big reaction to that, to this book. Um, and one last thing I'll say about sharp objects is I'm afraid of dollhouses now. Ooh, oh my gosh. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm going to have to read it now. Like, yeah, you have to know what's going on. I have on. to know what happens. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I'll definitely okay. be reading it again because I want to see if I can catch it this time, see what I missed the first time around. She needs to write a new book. It's been too long. I know. I know. I've read everything now that she's had published. I tried to take my time and I couldn't wait anymore. I read the last, the last <laughs> one I had left to read and now I've read everything and I'm just waiting. I know. I want more. Patiently, but I'm waiting. I want more. Um, is, I've never read Gone Girl. I'm I'm one of those people. I just never got on the train. Honestly, I've never um, checked it out and read it. I just have other stuff that I've been reading. But my sister, who doesn't read ever, if she reads, <laughs> it's a good book. And she read Gone Girl. And she was like, oh, my gosh, you have to read this book. So uh, now I have yeah. to read I have yeah. to read this. Sure, yeah, well, this is better, I think. Really? I don't know about you, George, yeah, but I, I think I like sharp objects better. Yeah, I think of the four books of Gillian Flynn's, I think Sharp Objects is my favorite, especially yeah. for such a short book. It was just so well crafted and you get so invested in the characters and 
like I did, you know, have a very real reaction to what happens. <laughs> and I, that's one of the things I love about reading. And that's why I love reading horror, especially because I like, I, I just think it's really cool when a book can make you feel something or react a certain way. I'm like, if you just add text on a page. How did you do that? So <laughs> that's no one, pictures. Yeah, <laughs> that's one reason why I love like horror and uh, mystery and thrillers so much. That's why I was really excited about doing this podcast. So um, when I was thinking about Rita likes for sharp objects, I was thinking more like which books might have a similar feeling. Um, and one that I've read recently is called Broken Monsters by Lauren Bukes. Um, so this one is like a crime thriller. So if you like Silence of the Lambs or something like that, something that's a crime novel kind of mystery, but you also like a little bit of the horror element in it. This one is really great. So with Broken Monsters, it's a crime slash thriller set in present day Detroit in which Detective Gabriel Versado juggles being a single working mother of a teenage daughter while solving the mystery of a murderer who turns their victims into quasi-human creations. Oh, God. <laughs> Is it like Frankenstein vibes? Um, I enjoyed Frankenstein. It's more like the victims are turned into something else. Like, he, like, makes them into art. Oh gosh, exhibit. oh that's yeah. terrifying. Yep. That goes past <laughs> spooky. That's like terrifying. Yeah, it was, and that's the opening chapter too. They're finding the first uh, oh, setup. That's they don't the even first give you time <laughs> to mentally prepare. It's, it's one of those books you're like, what in the world is going on? Like, um, another one I would relate that to is The Outsider by Stephen King. Mm -hmm. Surprise. Um, it's just one of those books, like, you have this, these horrible crimes, and it doesn't make any sense where it's coming from, and until you get to a certain point in the book, you're like, what is going on? I don't understand. Um, so that's kind of what happens in this book as well. So it's really interesting. Interesting. So. And that, that cover, too, is Mm -hmm. it just oh. like it just begs someone to pick it up and be like what is this like yeah it's just creepy <laughs> yeah and the the copy I read actually has a different cover um okay. but the other one is very similar in that way it's like a grayish blue cover with someone standing like profile in the like a trench coat kind of in the fog so you kind of get that feeling too like oh what are they what are they doing what are they up yeah to? so Okay, cool. Definitely a spooky one. Ugh. I knew you'd have them. I knew you would. <laughs> All right. So, Laura, you've got some other ones by one of my favorite authors. I do. I do. This is her new book. It is not even out yet, but it should be out, um, I do for the first week of October, sometime in October, I'll oh, say. Oh, good. Good. I know. And this was so good. So um, this is Alex Harrow's second book. Her first book was The 10,000 Doors of January, which was nominated for lots and lots of awards. And if you haven't read it, you absolutely should. And I know Shana will mm -hmm. make me up on that. Yeah, I actually, um, I did a so, book talk on it too. That's on our Facebook somewhere. Yeah, oh, one of my favorite you. books. So mm -hmm. this is her second book and it's called The Once and Future Witches. And she combines witchcraft and the suffragette movement, which are not things that you would naturally think pair together. So it has the same beautiful lyrical and atmospheric writing style that The 10,000 Doors of January had. It's a historical fantasy set in New Salem in the late 19th century. Witchcraft is forbidden. Women's dresses don't even have pockets because if they had pockets, they might carry around the things to make a spell, and we can't have that. Oh, so that's so why women's movement, clothes. That's why women's right? clothes don't have pockets. They do have a pocket. It's like this tall, and what am I going to put in that? Right. Nothing. Nothing. That's why. So the suffragette movement is trying to have a voice with the mayor and the town council of New Salem. The three Eastwood sisters haven't been together 
for several years. They had an abusive father and they all sort of left at different times and they don't even realize that they're all in the same city until they're all uh, in some form or fashion witnessing this big suffragette uh, demonstration and they feel a magical connection. So now that they're maiden mother and crone, they're all connected um, magically. They get the idea that they should bring back witchcraft, which is a daunting task. On the one hand, it could restore women's places in society. On the other hand, it could get all of them burnt at the stake. So um, this was just an amazing, amazing book. Uh, tackled some serious things, women's rights, uh, black rights, LGBTQ rights, very complex characters. All of the sisters are very different and she writes the book and it alternates chapters with each sister's point of view. And I think she did a beautiful job of capturing each one's voice because they're all very different people. So really beautiful piece of writing. Mm -hmm. And this is a haunting read that the ending just had me sobbing. Oh. But I definitely <laughs> wanted more. So it was just uh, yes, it will punch you in the feels. I will tell you that right now. I mean, it's not yeah. all darkness and despair. Yeah. It just, it's not that happy ending that you probably, as the reader, were hoping for. Yeah, well, but, especially oh. well, especially from the 10,000 Doors of January. I mean, it, it had a pretty happy ending, I thought, you know, and it kind of yeah. even, I thought, like, ooh, like, she could write a sequel to this, you know, if she wanted to, um, the way it ended. So... Oh my gosh, I can't wait to read it. And again, yeah. I always talk about book covers, but that cover is just mm -hmm. like, Isn't I that just want stunning? Yes. Oh, I love the colors yeah. too, because they're not like super bright, but they're like, they're faded, but the red is bright. I don't know. I just love it. Yeah. Every time I look at it, I see something different. Yeah. That, that like... was what I was thinking. <laughs> yeah. Oh, so, so good. Yes. Whoever her cover artists are, she's been incredibly lucky because they've done just beautiful work. They've done mm -hmm. a good job. Yeah. So my read alike for this one is The Year of the Witching by Alexis Henderson. In the lands of Bethel, where the prophet's word is law, Emmanuel's very existence is blasphemy. Her mother's union with an outsider of a different race has cast her once proud family into disgrace. So Emmanuel does her best to worship the Father, follow holy protocol, and lead a life of submission, devotion, and absolute conformity like all of the other women in the settlement. But a mishap lures her into the forbidden dark wood where the first prophet once killed four witches whose spirits still lurk there and they give Emmanuel the journal of her dead mother. Fascinated by the secrets in the diary, Emmanuel finds herself struggling to understand how her mother could have consorted with the witches. But when she begins to learn grim truths about the church and its history, she realizes that the true threat to Bethel is its own darkness. And she starts to understand that if Bethel is to change, it has to begin with, so another good witchy book. That one sounds really good. All right, I'm gonna move on. So a book that I've been reading pretty much every year the past few years is The Haunting of Hill House Ooh. by Shirley Jackson, who is one of my favorite authors ever. Um, Cause she, you know, she wrote a lot of really scary stuff and especially like being a like a, a female author at the time uh, she really um, pushed some boundaries there and I'm glad that she did because um, now we have all this really really awesome stuff from her um, so um, if you're a fan of the series on Netflix which I know I am and that's actually one of the few things that has been made the last few years that I think is genuinely terrifying. So bravo, Netflix. Um, but if you um, enjoyed the show, definitely, definitely check out the book. Anthropologist and ghost hunter Dr. John Montague invites three strangers to stay in Haunted Hill House for the summer. One of the guests is 32-year-old Eleanor, for whom three months in a haunted house is preferable to caring for her mother. Soon, Eleanor begins to see and hear things that the other guests cannot. Is it all in her imagination, or is she the only one who can perceive the evil that lurks in Hill House? 
So if you're into like ghost stories, this is like a really perfect ghost story. Um, a lot of it is told um, kind of from Eleanor's perspective. So you experience it as she experiences the house and like the, the sounds and the um, like seeing things that other people can't see. And it's just really, really creepy. So I try to take a trip um, to Athens, Ohio for um, Halloween weekend. Um, and the campus is absolutely gorgeous, like with the leaves and mm -hmm. it's just, it's just so nice. It's just a perfect like Halloween weekend getaway. Um, so what I did, cause it's a two and a half hour drive. Um, so I was like, I'm going to listen to the Haunting of Hill House, um, round trip. Cause I think it was just long enough, um, that it could fill up my entire trip. Cause I take... Um, the Appalachian Highway, um, which once you reach a certain point, there's hardly any traffic. And in October, it's just miles and miles of really, really beautiful trees and golden leaves and stuff like that. So just that drive and listening to this audiobook, it was really nice um, until they got to the, the scary parts and I was alone in my car. I was like, oh no. <laughs> I didn't think about this. Um, and I always recommend audiobooks for like the scary stuff or like mysteries as I feel like you just get a more in-depth experience with it and you become like more immersed in the story when it's being read to you and hearing it performed by somebody else. Um, you can't be like me and look at the last chapter. That's the other thing, because I will, if I have a book in my hand, I will just flip to the end. Like, I just have to know what? something. Yes! <laughs> but oh my I have gosh. more self-control now, but... Self-control. <laughs> I don't have any self-control. Well, it's not always so much a mystery, but if I'm very, very into the characters, like I'm emotionally engaged with them. And I think somebody's going to die. A lot of times I have to flip yeah. to like the last page. And it's not so much that I need to know what happens. I just want to know if I see their name or I don't, because I have to be braced if I don't see the name that yeah. they're possibly going to die. Yeah. I did that with the last Harry Potter book when it came out. I don't know why. I just flipped through and I like I, then I went and told my mom, I was like, this character dies, and this character dies, and this uh, character dies. So I try not to do that so much, but the yeah, audiobooks definitely hinder me from doing that if the need should strike me. I'm already kind of planning my reading list where I can read this book again this year because uh, I just love it and it's a really fast read it's like a hundred something pages it's actually like funny on some parts um it's one of those books like the characters are just very realistic and um there are like comic relief and horror or something yeah um breaks the tension a little bit yeah it kind of tells your brain like you're not actually in danger it's just a book um, so, um, but yeah, I am definitely going to be reading that again this year, and I, I've already been reading stuff by Shirley Jackson, because she's just the best. Um, let me see, and then for a read-alike, I picked another classic, uh, which I've read multiple times, uh, which is Dracula by Bram Stoker, and that's another one that I've read it and I listened to the audiobook actually just earlier this year and that's another one that's really fun on audio because um, it's an epistolary so it's not written like a traditional novel it's written in uh, diary entries and letters and sometimes I think like newspaper clippings or something like that so it's a very um, format wise not a traditional novel um, but it's like the gothic novel that I think pretty much everyone is aware of. Um, famous for introducing the character of the vampire Count Dracula 
The novel tells the story of Dracula's attempt to move from Transylvania to England so he may find new blood and spread the undead curse. It also tells of the battle between Dracula and a small group of men and women led by Professor Abraham Van Helsing. Dracula has been assigned to many literary genres, including vampire literature, horror fiction, the gothic novel, and invasion literature. So, so um, I've never read Dracula. Is he, like, was he created, like, how Frankenstein was created, or is he, like, just some creepy vampire that just came to be? I don't think. It's been a while since I've read it, but I... Right? I mean, isn't he just sort of, he just is? Dracula is kind of like the origin of all vampire beings and pretty much anything created by him. So that's why they're always trying to kill Dracula because anything created by him is then destroyed along with him. So he, he is just kind of like come into existence. Um, there is another book that I read recently. It's called Dracul, Draker Stoker, and uh, another author who he co-wrote with. And Draker Stoker is actually a descendant of Bram Stoker. But yeah, in the book, it, it actually starts with Jonathan Harker, who is from England, and he's going to Dracula's castle to, like, go over some business stuff because he wants to buy property in England. He doesn't tell him why he's buying property. He's buying property so he can um, drink English blood. <laughs> but he goes to Dracula's castle in Transylvania and Dracula is just there waiting for him in this huge castle. He asks about like his family and where he came from and he doesn't really tell him. So I think that like kind of that mystery behind that character I think is has stayed throughout different adaptations. I'll, I'll have to read it. It's a classic, so yeah, I'll have it, to finally read it. <laughs> yeah, and I it's really beautifully written cuz it's a gothic novel and I yeah. love gothic literature like the way they they describe like nature and architecture and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, and it is written in various points of view um, from diary entries and letters. So and yeah, I really enjoyed the good, it. The good thing, Shana, is that because it is a gothic novel, there's not a lot of gore and gross stuff. Okay. Mm -hmm. So if you're like me and you're like, mm, can't do that, it's creepy without being in your face gross and gory. What bothers me is the book that she recommended, The Haunting of Hill House, I don't like anything that's like haunted. So like if it's a haunted mm -hmm. house, a haunted okay. person, anything like that, I'm like, no, no. <laughs> I won't sleep at night. Okay. I won't sleep at night if I think there's like a demon in my house. Gory, I'm like, oh yeah, that's gross, but you know, oh, it doesn't bother okay. me. Yeah, with Dracula, I, I highly recommend the audiobook. It's you know, just one of those books that is just really fun to have it read and performed to you because it has that different format and that different um, different character voices and stuff like that. So that even though I only listened to it a few months ago, I'll probably listen to it again in the next <laughs> couple of weeks because I just can't stay away. Thank you Jordan and Laura for sharing your spooky book picks with me. Thank you listeners and viewers for joining us. Um, remember that you can always subscribe to our YouTube channel so that you never miss an episode. Thanks for joining us at Claremont County Public Library. And don't forget all of the show notes with links to all of the books and audiobooks that we talk about will be available on claremontlibrary.org. So thanks guys again. And until next time, reader, read on.